Sri Sri Anandamayama is a phenomenon of our times. And that she is a phenomenon is proved in an unmistakable way by this very retreat. That she, whom some of you may not even have seen, she who had been to you more a name than a fact, is bringing you together in this sacred spiritual fellowship on the banks of Ganga among the Himalayan mountains. Even after her physical body has been absent from amongst us for the past 14 years, she left her body in 1982, and yet her spiritual presence, her divine presence, brings us together here to be saturated in our thoughts in the vibration of her presence okay, in contemplating her life. This whole retreat is permeated with the Sri Sri Ma, which shows that they are always present, immortal, and the love and grace extends beyond barriers of physical space or temporal time. That she is very much present and her grace is very much active is proved by your gathering together here in this spiritual fellowship. May Master's glance of grace and hand of benediction be upon all of you and each and every one of you. Shri Shri Anandamayima and Gurudev Swami Shivani Maharaj were great spiritual phenomenon in our own generation. They were dazzling and effulgent spiritual lights towering among the ordinary and average holy personalities <coughs> like his own time Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa towered among all personalities, Ramana Maharishi, Sri Aravind Ghosh. So in their generation they were pinnacles of spiritual power and spiritual transforming force in our present day world. And it is in the spiritual presence of both of these great ones, great lights, that we are meeting day by day, morning, forenoon, afternoon, evening. To enrich ourselves spiritually, gather a rich harvest, and go home blessed. Start our, continue our, resume and continue our spiritual life with an added zest and impetus. This indeed, how blessings work. So may the grace of the divine and the blessings of Sri Ma and Gurudev ever be with you unto enlightenment, divine perfection and liberation. <coughs> that is my humble prayer at the feet of the Lord. Yesterday we were mentioning how without a field no harvest can be reaped. Therefore, paying all attention and diverting all our efforts at making this field as perfect as possible, keeping it as perfect as possible, so that it is able to produce harvest after harvest, 
year by year, rich harvest. So, it is within the field of our normal day-to-day -day life and the living of our day-to-day -day life that all our <coughs> yoga sadhana, spiritual life, our meditation, our worship, our adoration, our prayers, our japa, our karma yoga, everything is lived. Life provides the field. Our day-to-day -day life is a framework in which we function as spiritual seekers, as devotees of God, as yogis and sadhus. You should not forget, therefore, that making this field, making this framework best fitted to live a high quality spiritual life, best suitable and conducive and helpful and favorable to living a life of intense, sincere, progressive and successful spiritual sadhana. That will be part of our spiritual life, that will be part of sadhana. Seeing to it that this framework within which we have to function as seekers after God is kept noble, sublime, holy, pure, sacred, sanctity of our day-to-day -day life, our thoughts, our emotions and sentiments, our motivations, our actions. They should all be spiritual in quality. They should all be divine in their nature. Our actions, our speech, our actions, the way in which we relate ourselves with others, how we interact with them, how we react to them, all should be spiritual. All should be infilled with a divine quality, godly quality. Then alone your entire life, all its movements and every detail of it will be a perfect framework for evolving your own spiritual life. You cannot separate these two. You have to recognize this fact very clearly. See, all my yoga bhyasa, see, all my sadhana is done in the context of my life, day-to-day -day life, morning till evening, from the moment I wake up until I go to bed again. Throughout that day, which provides for me the field, I have to function as a spiritual being, as a sadhaka, as a seeker, as a devotee of God, as a yogi. Therefore they are interrelated in a manner that you cannot disconnect them and treat them as separate watertight compartments. They have no connection with each other. You will do it uh, at your own peril. You cannot afford to do it. You will be the loser. You will be deceiving no one. You will be deceiving yourself. You will be doing yourself a very bad turn. See? You will be your own uh, problem. You will be your own obstacle. See? Therefore, we must clearly see and recognize the inseparable relationship and the mutual interconnection with our life and our sadhana. They are one. Life has to be lived in a divine way, a sublime way. Our thoughts, speech and action <coughs> should be a supplement and a positive supplement to the entire spiritual life, to all aspects of our yoga and sadhana. This is wisdom. This is insight. This is proper understanding. See? All your activities should be done in a special way, O oh Arjuna. In the midst of your activity you have to pursue your spiritual life. Therefore, yoga karma sukaushalam. Yoga karma sukaushalam. While you live amidst these attractive uh, objects of maya in this world, in this Maya Super Bazaar. You cannot afford to be unwise. You have to be wise. Pain masquerades as pleasure. Sorrow deceives you in a deceptive way, putting on the guise of happiness. So you have to be perceptive, you have to be wise. Tukhayone evate adyantamanta kaunte nate eshu ramate buddhaha. Buddhaha means a wise person. 
You have every step you have to exercise wisdom. Every step you have to be wise. Then alone your life and sadhana will harmonize, blend together and form one see, integrated uh, whole, one integrated movement towards you all, all having the same quality, all having the same direction. And therefore there will be no dichotomy, there will be no inner mutual exclusiveness, there will not be a tug of war constantly going on one part of our life taking you in one direction, pulling you another part of your life, struggling to take you upwards, Godwards. Hundred percent of your life should be thus oriented, thus see, uh, uplifted and taken to a dimension that hundred part, part of your life, hundred percent of your life becomes a one single concerted movement towards the supreme attainment. Therefore it is not that sadhana is a part of life and life is another aspect of our sadhana. Therefore we have to deal with two things. No, there is no question of two things. It is not fifty-fifty. You must wisely live your life. Combine them the sadhana fifty-fifty. It is one hundred percent. Sadhana should be one hundred percent. Life should be one hundred percent. Life and sadhana should become identical. Life and sadhana should merge into each other and constitute, turn into and constitute one single Godward movement, one single Godward movement, one single identical process of the spiritualization and the divinization of your entire nature from head to foot as it were, entire nature in its totality, physical nature, sense nature, pranic nature, mental nature, intellectual nature, the nature of your emotions, your feelings, your sentiments, your motivations, all should undergo this transformation. You cannot afford to think that if a certain part of me undergoes a transformation and the other part of me lingers behind, it will. You should not opt for a second grade. Always opt for the first, first highest, best. Then Shadana proceeds like an arrow shot out of a bow, it's speeding towards a target. That is the one thing needful. When all things are propitious, all things are favorable, God is showering such abundance of grace upon our life. If we do not make the highest and the best use of it now, when are we going to do it? Uh, we cannot uh, play ball with God, you see. Uh, on His side He has done His very best, utmost best. And if we keep preservations, if we try to be clever, if we try to be clever, Cleverness may be very, very lucrative and very, very profitable in worldly life, the marketplace of one's mundane life. But cleverness is a great disadvantage. It's a handicap in spiritual life. It is a liability. So-called worldly wisdom and shrewdness and cleverness is a positive see, handicap and liability in spiritual life. Great Guru of Swami Vivekananda, Sri Ramakrishna said, again and again he used to say, See, there should not be this so called worldly shrewdness and cleverness in the Sadhana. It should be innocent, it should be naive, he should be plain, he should be simple hearted. Uh, he was very fond of using the word simple hearted, without any crookedness, without any so called cleverness. See, in M's translation of his conversation that you all know by the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, any number of times the word guileless comes. See, guile means cunningness. Guile means uh, shrewdness in a worldly way, not a spiritual way. 
Gail, eh, he's a gaily fellow, he's a wily fellow. A cunning, cunning person. Be careful, be careful. Eh? Like that, he used to say, eh, the more guileless, simple heart, innocent, see, uh, a seeker is, nearer he is to God, sooner he will attain God. For God reveals himself to a heart without guile without any type of crookedness. I was fond of saying this, reiterating it again and again. And therefore, the entire life should be raised to a level of spirituality. Every part of it, every moment of it, every day, you have to persist in it until the last. It is not for some time or period. All your life until the last breath remains in your body. You must persist in this very, very important the task until the very last. You must raise up your entire life to a level of spirituality and purity, of godliness and divinity. There should be a total acceptance of the spiritualization in all parts of your being, thought, word, intentions, emotions, sentiments, plans, skills, everything. It should be total acceptance of this in all parts of your being. No part should keep reservations, see. Then it becomes a hampering obstacle in your path. It keeps you tied down to a certain level. It does not allow you to go beyond that level. They say, mind you, here with keen attention, it's not easy to grasp the actual implication of this saying. It's a common saying, everyone knows, but no one ponders it. They say there is an iron chain. Iron chain is very strong. How strong it is? It is as strong as its weakest link. They say chain is made out of number of links. They say a chain is as strong as its weakest link. All the, if it has got 170 links uh, and 169 links are very, very strong, and one link is not that strong, then it is not the strength of the 169 links that will decide the strength of the chain to hold something, but it is this link that will decide the strength of the chain, its capacity to hold something or lift something. So they say a chain is as strong as its weakest link. It is saying that it's got great, great, uh, you see, relevance, great meaning for uh, the spiritual uh, seekers and sadhana. See, it is, uh, so you must ponder it. It is not an ordinary saying. See, it is, uh, it carries great meaning to us. Therefore, let us see that we are hundred percent strong, spiritual, divine, holy in all parts of the world. Yet there is not a link, you see, that we can serve our entire spiritual life. It is, uh, this, therefore, is the sharing due to the khyal of Ma. This, therefore, is the sharing by the grace and the benedictions of beloved Master, Swami Shiva Indi. So be it, grace of God, and the benedictions of Ma and Gurudev and all saints be upon you at this moment and Uttarakhand on the banks of Ganga. May you all attain self-realization and be liberated in this life, provided you fulfill all the requirements of spiritual life, sadhana life, divine life. Namami Narayana Pada Pankajam Karumi Narayana Pujanam Sada Vadami Narayana Namayamalam Smarami Narayana Tattum Om Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma Om Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma Om Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma Om Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma Om Ma Shri Ma Jaya Jaya Ma
Exactly at this juncture, at this period of your life, why God chose to call all of you together here and give you this period of spiritual fellowship, a time to reflect, a time to meditate, a time to think of our life in retrospect, a time to look forward to a period of earnest striving, sincere uh, seeking, and to attainment. See, it is a, a great turning point, and therefore, why it is? What does it signify to me? See, uh, these are things very, very necessary if we want to extract the fullest benefit from this uh, spiritual retreat of yours here. Hari Om. God bless you. To emphasize a point in this morning's sharing of the fourfold relationship, each individual soul automatically and naturally develops, has to develop, regulate, develop in a proper manner. From the moment one has come into this earth plane, in which we saw we are related to the source of our being. That relationship should not be forgotten and it has to be actively cultivated, actively made to develop and progress until it becomes our one and only total relationship. In God experience, that is one. Secondly, you said we must know the ideal relationship with God's creation, all life around us. And thirdly, we said we have to develop a certain relationship with ourselves. We owe a duty to ourselves. This is a gift given by God to us and therefore it is precious. And therefore we have to appreciate its value 
fully recognize and realize, uh, realize its value. And knowing that it is valuable, we should not uh, fail to make the highest and the best use of it. That also will be a sin of omission. See? If you uh, make a wrong use of it, misuse this great gift of uh, human status God has given us, then it will be a culpable uh, the, uh, the transgression of the law. But even if you fail to make the highest and best use of this uh, great gift, then it will be a sin of omission, omitting to do what we have to do vis-à-vis this uh, particular gift that God has given to us, our human status, our ability to think, feel, reason, and uh, advance in knowledge, the progress in wisdom, and move towards perfection, which is our birthright, which is our real goal. The, that perfection which is inherent in us, in that center of our being, which is our true identity, nijas swarupa, and that is the God nature, the uh, divyatva, divinity. And Gurudev Swami Shivani Maharaj was never tired of reiterating again and again upon this one fundamental fact, truth, you are divine. You have to know that you are divine. You have to realize your divinity. And while you live, you must make your whole life filled with this quality of your real nature, filled with this quality of divinity. Therefore, lead a divine life. Think divinely, speak divinely, act divinely, feel divinely. See, approach everything in a divine way. Thus, your very life should be a great blessing to all life around you, a blessing to God's creation. So, it is a right way of adjusting our relationship towards ourselves. We owe a duty to ourselves to make the best use of this gift. And we owe a duty towards God in the sense that we acquit ourselves favorably in His eyes. He look, I have given, sent this Jivatma, the most precious gift of all, the greatest gift of all, human status. Eh? Not without reason that the Bible says God created man in His own image in his likeness, that is, he made him divine. And thus, in discharging our duty to our, towards ourselves in a worthy and a correct manner, we automatically tend to discharge our duty towards God. See, if we recognize the value of human life and we therefore put it to the highest and noblest use, then we are saying, thank you, God, not by word, not by prayer, but by our uh, utilization of this precious gift of His. That is the best way to say thank you. You know, appreciate its value. And therefore here I am putting it to the noblest use. And God will be more pleased by the way, manner in which you live your life than your prayers and uh, three other things. Uh, that is the greatest adoration, the way in which you utilize His gift, the way in which you live your life. And thus we said, there is a threefold relationship which has to be regulated. Our relationship with our Maker, our source of our being. Our relationship with His creation in which we have to be and to live our life. And our relationship with ourselves, which if properly known, recognized and discharged, then our relationship with the creation of God will be ideal. See? It has to follow. See? If we know ourselves, and recognize the value of this gift and put it to the best use, then we become a blessing to God's creation. Not a problem or a liability, but we become an asset and uh, a solution to all problems. We become a center. And now, what is that fourth principle which tells us how to uh, regulate each one of these three relationships in the highest and best manner? That principle which thus helps us and guides us in setting up the right relationship in all these four, three contexts is the fourth factor which we have to relate ourselves with in a receptive way, in a positive way, in a, in a, in a reverential way. And that is the 
wisdom heritage global human society has revealed to the scriptures which try to bring to us god's will the scriptures revealed to us god's will as revealed to us through his great messengers of god masayas peer paigambar and prophets saints seers sages of realization to them he speaks okay and the wisdom teachings of the scriptures are filled with the uh, realizations the experiences and the admonitions the messages and the directives of these great realized liberated beings great soul beings <coughs> and so we have relate we have to relate ourselves to this source this factor in a meaningful and a creative and a constructive positive manner active manner not merely paying reverence to the scriptures and saying they are revealed revealers of god's will but actually accepting their teachings and trying to regulate our life mental verbal physical in the light of their teachings then we would be relating ourselves with this fourth factor in a really uh, healthy and a gainful manner and that fourth factor is called dharma now the point which i want to emphasize is important place dharma holds in this entire set of because it is dharma that tells you in what way you have to regulate your relationship with yourself and the god within you it is dharma that tells you in what way you have to regulate your relationship with the creation of god in which you have to live and with whom you have to deal see that you have to live and your entire life has to this is our setup all the creatures of god from grass and uh, plants and flowers and uh, insects it is dharma that tells us how we have to conduct ourselves in what way is the highest noblest way of relating ourselves with god's creation in which we are in which we have to live our life and attain our divine destiny and it is again dharma that tells us the right way we have to relate ourselves with the supreme being so in all these three dimensions of our human relational law the context it is dharma that becomes the light on the path dharma that becomes the pointer of the direction to finger it is dharma that becomes the silent guide by our side okay uh, therefore in gita lord krishna tells very very clearly you have to live your life regulating it in the light of the teachings of the uh, uh, wisdom uh, sources that is scriptures vedas he used the word vedas uh, shastra shastra uh, so live in the light of the injunctions for they are revealers of god's will and they are the the guides of mankind for in them the great sages and seers of realization have put there so dharma holds a key position in the center of all these triuna the dimensions of each individual soul's relationship once one has come into this earth plane for this great uh, pilgrimage which we call life where it will lead ultimately how it will culminate will depend upon how you relate yourself with dharma what place you give to dharma what value you give to dharma and in what way it plays a part in your moment to moment everyday life from morning till night each day of your life that is the importance of dharma that is the, therefore when they gave us the four four values to strive for and to pursue they gave dharma the first place is without it none of the other values can be pursued or uh, can be uh, attained so they gave dharma the first place they did not start from the grass to the saddle from the obvious to the uh, that which is beyond the obvious they did not say the artha kama dharma moksha that would be the in ascending states of subtlety and uh, 
purity, that should be the order. See, artha is a, the uh, money value because we have to live a life, food and clothing and shelter, etc. And then comes fulfillment of uh, legitimate longings of the human heart. Then comes the ethical idealism that should govern your life. Then comes the supreme spiritual value without attaining which life becomes a cipher. It becomes a waste. That would have been order. No, they did not give it in this as any order. That is very significant. We should consider it. They put dharma first. First and foremost is the dharma. Then only they gave the economical value, the emotional or vital value, and then the higher spiritual value. Because all depended upon the foundation of dharma. Okay? Uh, secular life devoid of dharma will take you to your own uh, see, perdition. It will take you to your own uh, undoing, ruin you. Therefore, everything has to be infilled by dharma, governed by dharma. That is the important, important place. And they made it, therefore, the prime value upon which depends your attainment, successful attainment, pursuing attainment to the other values. So that is, uh, therefore, Buddha only spoke of dharma. And uh, all the great ones have said, uh, Guru also said, no realization without ethical uh, perfection. Uh, it was not a, simply an overemphasis or exaggeration for the purpose of uh, giving importance to this factor. It was not. A, it was, there is a logic behind it, uh, a reason behind it. So I just want to emphasize the point that dharma should reverence as God itself. Dharma should enshrine in the heart. And dharma should be the lamp with which our carry our footsteps. And dharma should be our constant companion each and every moment, each and every uh, step we take in this life, day after day, morning till night. How are you? Uh,